good afternoon, everyone. So I am Reverend uh, Ryoko Miyazaki from Zenshuji. Uh, thank you so much for participating in Zenshuji uh, 100, 100 years anniversary lecture today. Now uh, we have Professor Long Shige who will introduce you, our two wonderful guest speakers here. Uh, Professor Kurashige, please go ahead. Okay, thank you and welcome back everybody for our ninth uh, monthly uh, lecture for to commemorate the 100th anniversary of Zen Chuji. Um, today uh, we have kind of our homegrown speakers today, which is really wonderful. Uh, we have Professor Lori Meeks, who is my colleague at the University of Southern California, but who is part of the Zen Chuji family. Um, her son has come here and both her husband as well um, to attend the Territoria Children's Group. And we've seen Lori and, and Jason at many um, Obon at Zen Chuji. And I know that she and Kojima Sensei uh, have done uh, classes together and so forth. And then uh, we have Doshin Diana Johnson, who was one of the, the, the reverends here, one of the monks here who have been here for a number of years and is very familiar to all of us at Zen Chuji. And she has given talks many times here um, in this fundo. So let me start by introducing um, Professor Meeks um, and, and uh, Reverend Doshin Diana Johnson, and then Lori will come and give a talk for about 20 to 30 minutes. Um, and then Doshin will follow up. And the general theme that they put together for both their talks is the title of the, the, the event here today, Encountering Buddhism in North America, Study and Practice. And I'm thinking maybe Doshin's more on the practice side and Lori's more on the study and teaching side. Um, okay, so uh, Professor Lori Meeks is Associate Professor of Buddhism uh, at the University of Southern California, where she has taught since 2004. She has published widely on Buddhism in pre-modern Japan, especially on women's reception and practice of Buddhism. And this includes her book, Hokkeiji and the Reemergence of Female Monastic Orders in Pre-Modern Japan. And she has published many other articles and edited books as well. Uh, she regularly teaches at USC a large general education course called Introduction to Buddhism, which I know about, and this is one of the reasons why I was really intrigued to have her talk about sort of how her students respond to Buddhism, at least at the start of the term maybe, and how they develop an understanding and maybe what she teaches a little bit. Um, because the general topic today for this September talk uh, is about sort of the broader world of how uh, how the broader world in America, in Los Angeles maybe in particular, um, understands Buddhism, because that's been so key to the history of, the 100 year history of Zen Shuji, is how the, the larger society responds to Buddhism and to Zen Shuji in particular. Okay, uh, in the past, Lori has served as co-chair of the Buddhism section of the American Academy of Religion, and she has served as chair of the Department of Religion, uh, at USC, and she was also weren't you director of the uh, Shinzo Ito, uh, associate director of the Shinzo Ito um, Center for Japanese Religious and Cultures. Um, now on to introduce Reverend Doshin Diana Johnson, who is a Soto Zen Buddhist priest serving as assistant minister at Sozenji Buddhist Temple in Montebello, which is just very close to here and very closely affiliated with um, Zen Shuji. Originally from Kansas City, Missouri, she spent 30, I know that's important, Kansas City, Missouri, and she spent 30 years as a social worker and public servant in Chicago before beginning seminary at Chicago Theological Seminary. Following further study at the New York Zen Center for Contemplative, Contemplative Care, hospice, hospice work in New Mexico, and a hospital chaplain internship in California, she received the Masters of Divinity in Buddhist chaplaincy from the University of the West in 2020. This year, um, she completed a mental health chaplain residency at the La Jolla Veterans Administration Hospital, 
Uh, Doshin is bilingual in English and Spanish and married nearly 30 years to her wonderful husband, Rob. So we're going to start with Lori and then we'll turn to Doshin. So take it away. Thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and take off my mask. Okay. Um, well, it's nice to meet you all. I know a lot of people are joining by Zoom uh, today. I hope that you'll still be willing to ask some questions at the end. Um, it's really an honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, it's, yeah, it's just such an honor to be a part of this 100th anniversary of Zen Shuji. It's a really monumental uh, anniversary. So thank you also, Lon, for the very generous introduction. Um, as Lon explained, my area of research is mostly pre-modern Japanese Buddhism. Um, and I focus a lot on kind of the intersection of social history and intellectual history. So I'm really interested in the doctrines and teachings, but also in how people use those doctrines and teachings. Um, and I've done a lot of work also on women's reception of Buddhism. So how did women understand different doctrines, especially those doctrines that were about gender uh, and so on. Um, and so I've worked mostly on the periods from around the 11th century to the 15th century. I've done a little bit of work on the Tokugawa era as well. Um, and yeah, I've been very interested in understanding how women uh, practice Buddhism during those periods. Um, I've also been working lately uh, with a colleague at the University of Virginia named Paul Groner on translating sermons by uh, a priest named Aeson, who was born in 1201 and died in 1290. Um, and he was very active. He was a Ritsu school uh, priest. He was very interested in the, in the precepts, um, but he also uh, grew up kind of in the Nara area and he was active. His father was a Kofubuji monk and he uh, was he knew what was going on with the kind of new Zen groups that were forming around that time. And he was very interested in what was going on in China and so on. Um, so there's kind of a lot of overlap between the study of early Zen and, and what I'm looking at with Aesom. So, um, so Zen is something I'm very interested in as well. Um, and as Ron uh, picked up on, <laughs> uh, Reverend Doshi and I are kind of share, I'm sort of talking about study and teaching of Buddhism, and she's going to talk more about practice. So our, our views will be very different, but I, I we really enjoy getting to know each other, or I really particularly enjoy getting to know you as a part of uh, this invitation. Um, we've had a chance to uh, sit and talk, um, and that's that's been really wonderful, and I look forward to, to hearing her remarks today as well. So I've been teaching at USC for almost 20 years, uh, unbelievably, <laughs> and um, one of my favorite classes to teach, and one that I teach now every year, is Introduction to Buddhism. Um, and it's a course that, that uh, fulfills a general education requirement called humanistic inquiry. So it's by no means a required class for students, but a lot of students take the course in order to, to fulfill the particular requirement. So humanistic inquiry courses in this category are meant to introduce students to major world traditions um, of literature and philosophy, traditions that explore human experience from a really broad perspective. Um, so I thought I would start out today by reflecting on some of my goals in teaching this course, as well as my impressions of student experiences in the course. This course usually enrolls about 100 to 150 students, so most of them uh, are not going to go on to take other courses in Buddhism. They're probably not going to take other courses in religious studies. Most of them, a, a lot are in the business school or engineering. They're from all different uh, majors. And um, so, so many come in with some kind of interest in, in Buddhism, but many don't. <laughs> so it's just, it's uh, a very diverse group of students. Um, so I thought I would talk about sort of what my um, approach to teaching the class has been and sort of how it's developed or what it's developed into, I guess, over the years. Um, and what I think students connect most with in the class in terms of uh, the assignments and so on. Um, so as you, you know, there's a long legacy in North America of Buddhism being treated as a kind of alternative religion, uh, right? Certainly for many who grew up Christian or Jewish in North America, um, they may have been taught to view Buddhism as a kind of alternative to the, to the uh, tradition that they grew up in. Um, and of course, in the 60s and 70s in North America, uh, many Buddhist groups and teachings did come to be associated with countercultural movements and sort of this broader idea of an alternative culture. Um, 
So I think that perspective has been kind of important in thinking about American history um, and Buddhism's role in American history. So it's useful, it's been useful in certain ways and I think it's been useful to certain groups of people, but I wonder if it hasn't also been damaging in some ways, especially to Asian American Buddhists um, and Asian Buddhists living in, you know, here uh, for whom Buddhism is not alternative, but is actually an Orthodox tradition, right? Um, so my perspective in teaching Buddhism has really been to treat it as a classical tradition and as a major sophisticated philosophical and scholastic system. And I'm, I'm kind of, you know, very nerdy about <laughs> Buddhist texts. So I, I get very much into that idea of you know, this is a classical tradition. If we look at monasteries in uh, pre-modern Asia, these were often kind of like the universities, right, of, um, of the region. And so we have just all of these amazing erudite scholars in Buddhist history. Um, and I like to kind of convey that to students, uh, that the, the Buddhist monks and nuns living long ago in Asia are in some senses doing what you're doing here at the university, you know, uh, studying about the human condition and thinking through, through uh, philosophy and so on. Um, so, uh, I really feel that in teaching about Buddhism, it's important to put Asian history and culture at the center and not American culture. I mean, certainly there, those can be useful courses too, um, but that's just not what I focus on in this, in this particular course. Um, so I don't treat Buddhism as countercultural at all, but try to help students understand its broader cultural context and influence in Asia. Um, I also like to emphasize how Buddhism has served as this force of connection and continuity across diverse parts of Asia, linking South and Southeast Asia with North and Northeast Asia. So that Buddhism, one of the really fascinating things about Buddhism is it links this, these really broad regions um, that at certain points in history didn't have a lot of, a lot of interaction um, in much of the pre-modern period, but Buddhism does serve as this kind of um, force of connection. Um, I also really emphasize the diversity of the Buddhist tradition or traditions. Um, and uh, that's something that does sometimes take some students by surprise because often we have this idea of, uh, you have this religion and this religion and this religion and all Buddhists do X, Y, and Z and believe X, Y, and Z and so on. But the Buddhist tradition is extremely diverse. Um, and then finally, I feel like it's important just to emphasize the depth and sophistication of Buddhist philosophies and texts. And this is something that students can connect with Buddhism as a great humanistic tradition that can help us, um, <clears throat> that can help one better understand both ex human experience and Asian culture, regardless of one's own religious identity. So you don't need to be Buddhist to appreciate Buddhist teachings or Buddhist cultural influences. Um, and I think most students, uh, that, that idea is usually driven home. They, they usually connect with that idea. And, and even if they have no interest in going to Buddhist temples themselves, uh, learn, can really appreciate Buddhist teachings. Um, I think today, fewer and fewer students at USC or even in Los Angeles think of Buddhism as necessarily exotic or countercultural. Um, our current classes of students tend to be very international, very diverse. Um, many have personal connections with Buddhism. Uh, they may have grown up in Asia, they may have close, or they may have close family members um, who've grown up in Asia or who identify as Buddhist and so on. Um, so I think there's, there's, we experience at least here in LA, less of the idea that Buddhism is an exotic tradition, which you might experience if you were teaching Buddhism, say in the Midwest or the South, it would probably be quite different. Um, but I, I find that, that students here um, don't come in with quite as many biases as, as probably they did a, a few generations ago or in other parts of of the country. Um, at the same time, though, a lot of students are surprised by the diversity of the Buddhist tradition, I think. Um, so as you know, there's, there, historically, there's been no uh, central authority in Buddhism, and this has allowed for a lot of variation across different regional centers of Buddhist activity. So some scholars even like to talk about Buddhisms in the plural rather than Buddhism in the singular given the major doctrinal differences between say Theravada Buddhist, uh, Mahayana Buddhist, Vajrayana or esoteric Buddhist. Um, I mean, I tend to think that there's enough continuity in Buddhist traditions to talk about Buddhism um, as a shared tradition, but I still mention this idea to students. Like it's diverse enough that some scholars wanna say Buddhisms 
Um, and I'd like to emphasize that on most topics, we can't say that there's a Buddhist perspective, that we can't, even if we're talking about something like abortion or uh, the use of violence, we can't say this is the Buddhist position, right? We really have to look at what different Buddhist groups at different points in time and different places have said on the topic. Um, and as you know, even meditation, which is so strongly associated with Buddhism in contemporary culture and contemporary global culture, um, has been used in very different ways by different Buddhist communities. Um, in some communities, it's not emphasized as a major practice, um, especially for lay people. And sometimes this is kind of a bias that Americans project onto Buddhists. Oh, well, if you don't meditate, you're not a real Buddhist. Well, there have been lots of real Buddhists right, uh, throughout throughout time um, who have not meditated and not made it a major practice. So uh, that's something that some students are, are surprised by. Um, and it's, I think, important to emphasize that this is you know, just part of the diversity of Buddhism. There are diverse practices that count as Buddhist. Um, so in viewing Buddhism as a major philosophical and scholastic system and as a really important cultural force in Asia, I think it's possible for students to learn a great deal from classical Buddhist texts without converting to Buddhism or even you know, necessarily needing to consider that. Um, so while I do like to discuss aspects of Buddhist practice in my lecture, and I think it's really important. I try to bring in um, monastics from time to time to talk to my students. We do field trips if it's a small enough class. It's hard with a class of 100 or 150. Um, but Kojima Sensei has very generously visited my classes many times. Um, and I brought small groups of students here before as well, um, which I think is just uh, really a great experience for students. Um, but uh, what I tend to focus on in the, in the class is really a broad range of classical Buddhist text. So um, these are mostly sutras, sometimes commentaries, poetry, Chan and Zen teaching, records, uh, sermons sometimes, narrative, literature, and even ritual text. Um, and what I want to do today is to kind of, is to share with you some of the passages from Buddhist texts that I assign in my classes that I think students really connect with or that I've seen students really connect with. Um, and the book that I've been using most recently is part of this Norton anthology of world religions. You can see mine is missing the back cover because it's so well used and very marked up. Um, but this is an anthology of uh, primary sources from the Buddhist tradition. So all of the different types of sources I've just mentioned um, in translation, usually it's short passages from uh, the text rather than the whole text, but in translation with pronunciation guides and, and things like that. Um, and this has, has been a very useful uh, book for the class. Um, so I'll go ahead and share some uh, passages with you. So I'm going to kind of mention, I think I've got five or six um, kind of big ideas or themes that we see in the literature. And these are big idea ideas or themes that I think students really connect with, even if they wouldn't at all consider themselves Buddhist. There are ideas that, that um, are very uh, universal in, a sen in, in many senses or that speak to universal concerns and that I've seen students connect well with. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, so the, the first idea is just impermanence and the inevitability of suffering and death. I mean, this is sort of one of the first ideas we start out with in talking about Buddhism in the class. Um, so for some students, these ideas still feel pretty abstract. Um, if, if they've been fortunate enough not to have you know, experienced the death of a loved one um, because they're so young. Uh, these ideas might feel sort of abstract, but um, conceptually, I think we all understand and tend to worry about uh, the fact of death, right? So connecting with Buddhist perspectives on death and Buddhist perspectives about how we might cope with this inevitability um, of death is, is meaningful for a lot of students. Um, this year, I'm actually teaching a, another course, a freshman seminar on the Bodhisattva path, and we're reading Shanti Deva's uh, Bodhicharya uh, Vatara, which is um, sometimes translated as Guide to the Practice of the Bodhisattva. 
Uh, and near the beginning of this work, Shanti David does talk a lot about the inevitability of death, which of course is a topic not just in Shanti Deva, but really throughout Buddhist literature. But there's some really beautiful passages in here, so I thought I would share those. Um, he says, those I loathe will die, those I love will die, I too will die, and all will die. Everything experienced fades to memory. Everything is like an image in a dream. It is gone and not seen again. So here, it's not just the fact of death, but also the fact that of loss, right? So losing memories that, of the fact of impermanence, right? We can't hold on to anything, even our memories. Um, even in this life, as I have stood by, many loved and loathed have gone, but the evil occasioned by them remains ghastly before me. Um, so, oh, oh uh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I wanted to talk about this one a little yeah. bit more. Um, so I, this, this last uh, stanza here, I think also speaks to uh, karma in a way that's really understandable, that um, even if people who've committed, we know that everyone is going to die. Those who've committed evil actions will die, but the legacy of those actions remains. Um, so this is, like, I think, a very understandable way uh, to think about karma, even if, you're, even if you don't share the worldview of karma and transmigration or rebirth, it's very easy to understand this idea that um, you know, we've, we've got this period of life when we're here, we're not going to be here that long, but if we commit a lot of evil, that's going to be left behind for those who follow, right? Um, so this is a very, I think it's very easy to connect with um, Shanti Deva's work, which is considered, you know, one of the major classics of the Mahayana tradition. Okay, uh, so, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe the next one. Um, so then the next idea, actually, this is from a text called the Dhammapada uh, versus on the Dharma. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. Um, some say it dates back perhaps even as early as the third to the er third century BCE. So it's considered one of the earliest uh, collections of, of aphorisms uh, from the Buddhist tradition. And I'm starting out here with one more uh, stanza about the inevitability of death. There's a lot of this in the Dhammapada about the body as being useless because it's something that's going, it's impermanent, it's not going to stay healthy forever. Um, so here we have, soon indeed this body on the earth will lie, pitched aside without consciousness, like a useless chip of wood. So that uselessness of the body. Um, this is a theme that runs throughout Dhammapada. But I wanted to show you, if you can uh, forward to the next slide, please. Okay. Um, another theme that we see really clearly in the Dhammapada uh, or verses on the Dharma is this idea that our relationship with our minds is absolutely central to all of our experiences in life. And this is an idea that I, I think often leaves an impression with students. Uh, so the Dhammapada is, is one place where we, we get a lot of, um, we see this theme really articulated in a beautiful way. Um, it's also a theme though that, that of course we find throughout Buddhist literature. Um, but here the idea is basically is that your mind can either be your absolute best friend in life or it can be your worst enemy and that the choice is yours. Rather you cultivate your mind and kind of rein it in, train your mind, or you allow your mind to be overtaken by defilements and distractions, by ignorance and craving and so on, right? Um, so I think this, this two students can see is very practical and useful advice. Like, and then, I mean, in, in many ways, this is what cognitive therapy is about too, right? Learning to train your mind so that your mind is a friend, your inner voice is a friend and not a foe. So the Dhammapada says, what a foe may do to a foe or a hater to a hater, far worse than that, the mind ill held may do to him. And then we see the other side. So this is if you treat, if you don't uh, bother to cultivate your mind, uh, it will harm you more, more than any enemy. But if you do train your mind, um, your mind will be a better friend, will treat you better than any loved one. Not mother, father, nor even other kinsmen may do that good to him. Far better than that, the mind well held may do to him. And then we have a little bit more of the same idea. This is actually 
These stanzas are a little from a little bit earlier in the text, but also similar ideas in the Dhammapada about the importance of um, kind of reigning in the mind, training the mind. The quivering, wavering mind, hard to guard, hard to check. The sagacious or wise one makes straight, like a fletcher, an arrow shaft. Commendable is the taming of mind, which is hard to hold down, nimble, alighting wherever it wants. Mind subdued brings ease. So we often talk in class about you know, the kind of classical Buddhist idea of the mind as a monkey, as this wild monkey that you have to train. I think later in the Zen tradition, it's an ox that you train rather than a monkey. But in any case, the consciousness as a wild animal. Um, but if you're able to subdue it, uh, it, it can bring happiness and ease. Um, this, I think, is very easy to relate to. Um, OK, then the next idea I want to discuss is the idea that we're all profoundly interconnected. Um, and that one we can see on the next slide. So this idea, of course, occurs throughout Buddhist literature, um, but it's a very powerful teaching for helping us connect with others and for cultivating empathy, also for overcoming anger that we might direct towards others. Um, I think many students find especially striking the theme found in a great deal of Buddhist literature um, which is that all beings have been my mother, father, brother, sister, et cetera, in a previous life. Um, so again, even if students don't necessarily believe in transmigration and rebirth, it's still, can, they can still use this as kind of a metaphor for thinking about um, how, uh, how to overcome ill feelings towards someone that might be hard to like or hard to love. Um, and this is a passage from Buddha Gosa, um, from his text called Visuddhi Maga, um, which is uh, sometimes translated into English as the path of purification. Um, Buddha Gosa lived around the fifth century CE. And um, this is a passage where he talks about this idea of beings, people that we encounter uh, possibly being, who might be difficult to love now, as being someone who actually cared for us in some past life. And he talks about this as a way to help us overcome ill feelings we have towards others. So here he says, here is what is said, bhikkhus, so talking monks, um, it is not easy to find a being who has not formerly been your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your son, your daughter. Consequently, he should think about that person thus. This person, it seems, as my mother in the past carried me in her womb for 10 months and removed from me without disgust as if it were yellow sandal wood, my urine, excrement, spittle, snot, etc., and played with me in her lap and nourished me, carrying me about on her hip. Um, <laughs> so this may help if, if uh, we're stuck on, on finding it difficult to get along with someone. We can imagine them as this selfless mother in the past. Um, and, and, and there are so many places in Buddhist literature, of course, where this interconnection, this idea of interconnections with others um, is powerful. Um, but certainly this, this idea that we've all been, we're all connected in these past lives, uh, I think students find uh, very powerful. Um, okay, and then the next idea I wanted to talk about is the idea that dualistic thinking causes suffering. So this is an idea we get into um, when the course develops into uh, a discussion of Mahayana Buddhism, and we talk about the theory of emptiness. Um, and I think the idea that dualistic thinking causes suffering can be a really practical application of emptiness theory. Emptiness is this very abstract idea for most students. Um, but, uh, if, if we continue talking about it and we think about why, why can categories be damaging? Why is, what, what kinds of problems are caused when we see things as clearly defined, when we rely upon categories too strongly, um, is that we reify categories that ultimately cause suffering. Um, so most of us can see how things like racism, sexism, ageism, ableism, et cetera, all of these isms uh, rely upon dualistic thinking, right? They rely upon these categories um, that cause us to uh, act on biases where we see one category as better than the other and so on. Um, so one, of, one, of, one passage that we often use to talk about this idea as um, emptiness being 
uh, or I'm sorry, as dualistic of dualistic thinking as being at the root of suffering is this passage from the Vimalakirti Sutra. So the Vimalakirti Sutra is from the early, from the first or early second century CE. Um, of course, a, a very uh, popular sutra in East Asia. But this is a conversation in the text between the Bodhisattva Manjushri and the great uh, layman Vimalakirti. So Manjushri says, what is the root of desire and greed? And Vimalakirti says, false and empty distinctions are the root. Manjushri says, what is the root of false and empty distinctions? Vimalakirti says, topsy-turvy thinking is the root. What is the root of topsy-turvy thinking? Groundless assumptions are the root of topsy-turvy thinking. What is the root of groundless assumptions? What is groundless can have no root. Manjushri, it is on the root of this groundlessness that all other concepts are built up. So that we, we tend to build up all of these concepts on, on nothing basically, right? On false, on false um, assumptions, which lead us to uh, topsy-turvy thinking and empty distinctions and so on. And this eventually becomes the root of, of desire and greed. Um, so it's this, this Mahayana way of thinking about uh, where desire and greed come from. And I think uh, even though this is sometimes rather abstract, it's something that students connect with, that they can think about concrete ways um, to understand how the theory of emptiness is useful and can relieve suffering. Um, okay, next slide, please. So I just have two more ideas. Um, another theme is that we all have the potential for Buddhahood within. Um, I think this idea can be very empowering, both in terms of its insistence that we are all equal in our underlying Buddha nature or Buddha, you know, uh, potential Buddhahood. Um, and it's also very empowering because it affirms that we all have a kind of limitless potential for goodness and for compassion. Um, and one of the texts that we talk about in the course is the, called the Tathagata Garbha Sutra, um, like the, the Buddha uh, womb or Buddha matrix sutra. Um, it dates probably to the late third century CE. And it's kind of the place where we see the beginnings of the idea of Buddha nature. Um, so this is a text that talks about how all beings have these hidden, a hidden Buddha within. Um, and so this is a place that kind of summarizes this idea. It says, in the same way, I see that all sentient beings without exception are like golden figures covered with clay. Their outside crusts are the sheaths of defilements, but inside there's the Buddha knowledge. Um, so this is a, a really beautiful text that I think students find really intriguing, um, but also uh, empowering in a lot of ways as well. Okay, and then finally, I have one more theme I wanted to discuss. Um, and this is the idea of um, kind of experiencing a state of oneness with an activity that we're fully engaged with. Um, so kind of like achieving a flow state, uh, which is how we would say it in, I guess, modern psychological terms. Um, so most students today are, are uh, encouraged to be, most of us, not just students, right, are encouraged to be multitasking all of the time, to be doing a whole bunch of things at once. Um, but one thing we really see in Buddhist texts, and especially um, in Chan and Zen texts, is the importance of, of just sort of focusing on what you're doing at a particular time, like being absorbed in um, the activity that you're engaged in at a particular time. Um, so in, in my class, we often talk about this in the context of Taoist thought, and then Chan and Zen thought. And I talk about some of the influence of, of Taoist ideas on Chan and Zen. Um, some of you may have heard of Francis Stojan Cook. Uh, he was a, or he is a, um, a Soto practitioner. And I think a monk who also, maybe from the LA Zen Center, I'm not sure, um, who did some translations uh, of Dogen's Shobo Genzo. And um, in his introduction, uh, to uh, some of those translations, he talks about a Buddhist practice, Buddhist practice as being similar to playing the piano. Um, so he says, you don't know you're uh, a Buddha until you practice. You don't know, you, you can't realize your Buddha nature unless you actually sit in meditation, right? Um, so until you sit, you don't know that you're a Buddha. And this is similar to how a great pianist, a virtuoso pianist, wouldn't know of her talent until she actually picks up um, 
picks up a piano. I think I started out with the idea of a violin. You wouldn't pick up a piano until she actually sits down at the piano and starts practicing um, and, you know, begins, begins to learn of her talent, right? Um, when she masters her talent, though, she experiences a state of profound absorption in which all other thoughts fade away um, and time seems to pass quickly. She's kind of at one with her instrument, with the piano. Um, so many students can connect with this notion of a flow state and appreciate uh, kind of parallels between this kind of mental absorption um, and the observations that we see made by a lot of Chang and Zen practitioners who talk about experiencing glimpses into their Buddha nature. Um, and I think on the next slide, uh, I, oh, this is it, I'm sorry, rest. thank you, this yeah. is the last one. So this is actually from Francis Dojin's cook from that uh, introduction I mentioned. He says, however, our unrealized Buddha nature does not illuminate and transform our everyday lives. It is somewhat like having a talent for music. We may be told that we have this talent and the knowledge may be gratifying, but we are still unable, for instance, to play the piano. The potential is real, but remains unactivated and unrealized. If the individual begins to practice, the talent will itself become evident in the practice. The ability to play the piano is a latent talent now realized. Our Buddha nature is like this, he says. Um, so I think that this is something students uh, can often connect with. Now, one other thing that I would say students have been consistently interested in is Buddhist cosmology. So karma, transmigration, the six realms of rebirth, pure lands, etc. cetera. Uh, usually in the first week, well, first several weeks of a uh, Buddhism course, everyone has so many questions about Buddhist cosmology. Um, and, uh, and often they ask these really hypothetical, uh, difficult questions that I can't answer about cosmology. Um, and it's, it's interesting just to see how that's, that's been true for almost the 20, for the nearly 20 years I've been teaching Buddhism. Um, there's this consistent interest in Buddhist cosmology. I guess that thinking through Buddhist cosmology really stretches a lot of us to think about the world, our place in it, the effects of our actions and so on from a perspective that's just very different um, from what a lot of students have grown up with, especially if they've grown up here. Um, so I, I apologize. I think I've talked longer than I anticipated. <laughs> um, so I, I, uh, there are many more examples, but I hope these passages give you a sense of some of the ideas that I've seen really capture the attention and interest of students over the years. Um, I think Buddhist texts offer such powerful insights on the human condition um, and really help students connect with others who, though they may have lived in uh, times and places far away, uh, from us now can really teach us how to face um, what are very universal problems really of human suffering. Of course, there's old age sickness and death, but there's also the emotional distress that comes from uh, pain and loss that, that we all experience uh, throughout our lifetime. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thanks to everyone on Zoom as well. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, just, uh, please take off that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I also am deeply honored to be invited uh, to offer comments. I've enjoyed so much this series that's been building all year. Really enjoyed very personal stories and yet. Uh, very um, inspiring personal stories. So um, thank you. So actually, uh, okay. so I I'll refer. I'll pick up where uh, one of the things that uh, both Lauren and Lori mentioned a dichotomy, maybe a separation between study and practice. Um, really, our Zen master Dogen, who's the founder of our tradition, or well, I should speak on. Uh, um, I was talking about the dichotomy or the dualistic consideration of study and practice and being separate. But really, Dogen said that we should think of ancestor study and the practice of zazen as two rocks, one in each hand, and we rub them together until there's no gap between them. And so and you'll see, I, I am also inspired and was captured 
by the practice of Buddhism and its meaning uh, through many verses and, and gathas that, that I'll also share with you today. So we are so, cannot share the soul. Well, I start out with this cartoon. <laughs> and it talks, and it says Zen Buddhism. And so one square has, what's the first square? Uh, so it's sort of what, what my friends think I do as a Zen Buddhist. Okay. And it has a picture of these, oh, okay, maybe it's coming. Hey! Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. It's a, a picture of these, these oh, oh. folks that, ah, this one? had it. That's the one. Uh, uh, first one? Yeah. That's uh, the uh, uh, this one. Okay. okay. So, Zen Buddhist. so these are various perspectives on what people might think about what Zen Buddhism is. So what my friends think I do, right? <laughs> that I levitate, you know, that I'm happy, that mm -hmm. I just sort of have this wonderful practice that's superhuman. Um, maybe what society thinks I I do is, oh, you know, right. I'm a cool kind of hipster, someone who is um, a counterculture, totally. Um, the ticket on the left. That's not slideshow. That's right. Oh, yeah. uh, okay. A slideshow. And then from the beginning. Uh, this one? Hi. Oh, hey. oh thank, you. Okay. thank you. Oh, that right. Okay. Uh, so, in this what my mom thinks I do. And it's a, oh. a ticket to hell. Right? Oh. Some people think, right, because you know, you're know you you're going against Christianity and you're you know, godless. Right? Um, what other Buddhists think I do? Some other Buddhists might think Zen is very severe, mm -hmm. very strict. And uh, so they, they picture us as angry. In the middle is a picture of a monk sitting Zazen with his begging bowl, right? So. This is maybe sometimes what I think I do. But in the end, what I really do is I do everyday life. I do laundry. Oh. I have to clean my dirty laundry. I have to clean my family's mm -hmm. dirty laundry, kitchen, make beds, all of those everyday activities, right? So in fact, as Lori mentioned, um, we should do one thing at a time. Do it well. Do it completely. And so um, it, it has that notion of personal responsibility. Right? There's a, a young monk who comes to the monastery and um, is so eager to begin practice. And he asks the abbot, so, so I'm ready now. What, what, what do I, where do I start? What do I do? He says, well, did you have breakfast? He says, yes. Well, go wash your cup. Go wash your dishes. And then you begin your practice, your practice of what is I'm doing and we can go to the next slide. So that's just a, just an introduction with some general attitudes and uh, pointing to the task of daily living as what we Zen Buddhists do. more louder. Louder. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> um, we can have the next slide then. The next slide. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay, so my proposition in thinking about practice is I think it's important for us to recognize that we're inheriting this practice. This is not something that we just have thought about, but that it comes to us from ancient times. It comes to us from uh, our teachers. It comes to us from our engagement with one another. So we're, I think this is important not to, not to skip the awareness of actually being the receiver of inheriting this practice. Okay. And it requires, I think, for Americans, some sense of letting go of cultural convention. Okay. Secondly, we strive to live the practice. So the teachings are beautiful everywhere you turn but it requires us to directly engage the other, the other person, the other subject. Not that they're distinct from us, as in subject and object, but they are, in fact, us. There's that interconnection that Lori also spoke about. And thirdly, we hope to carry this 
practice forward by living the practice as an example. So that's where, again, the personal responsibility, study, and practice together. Okay, thank you. So I came to the practice of Buddhism, by, and you can leave it here for me. Um, when I went to train as a hospice volunteer, and a very wise trainer suggested that all of us trainees should adopt meditation as a form of self-care when we're doing hospice volunteer, mm -hmm. when we're sitting beside someone who's dying or attending to a family of someone whose loved one is dying. Um, so I said, right, where do I learn? Where do I learn meditation? I said, go see the Zen guy. Okay. Oh. So this was in a small town. Well, you say small, 100,000 in South Central New Mexico. And there was a fully ordained, uh, you can take the next slide. Oh. Uh, priest who was a disciple of Reverend Dr. Soyu Matoka. I don't know if you've heard this name in our talk so far this year, but he was actually a missionary who came to Zen Shuji. From Zen Shuji, he also went to Sokoji for a while. Mm, yeah. And then he became the second head priest at Long Beach Buddhist Church. Mm. The thing about Matsuoka Sensei is that he... He left the Soto Shu at some point. I, I'm certainly not a scholar about him, and I don't know mm -hmm. a lot of the details. I'm not sure anyone does. But um, ostensibly, he left to teach Americans, mm -hmm. and that he found it difficult maybe to serve two different communities, and he opted to, um, to teach Americans. As such, he did not have a temple, per se. You can go to the next okay. sentence. But what he did was he would have mobile Zendo practice. Or he would go from house to house. And he had a, a number of followers and a number of disciples. And the four that you see there on the left or the right, depending where you're looking, um, were four priests in Las Cruces, New Mexico. And the person that first began teaching me Zazen is all the way in the corner with the purple rakasu over his black uh, robe. His name is Harvey Daiho Hilbert. He was a Vietnam combat veteran um, who was also a social worker ministering to combat veterans in the area in New Mexico. Um, Matsuoka also emphasized that um, any kind of credentials for priests or Buddhists were secondary to the personal practice of Zazen meditation. He believed strongly in the development of a lay practice. So he wasn't, he didn't come into this teaching to grow priests. He came to give Zazen as a practice to lay Americans. So um, Matsuoka Roshi then was the Dharma grandfather to the fellow in the middle, uh, Ken McGuire, Hogaku Ken McGuire, and the Dharma Grand, so Dharma father can study directly with Matsuoka. Mm -hmm. And then Daiho was a student of Ken's. So that, so I felt very lucky in this small town in central New Mexico, one of the least populated states in the country, to find uh, a Zen tradition that, um, that was planted by a Soto Zen missionary to this country. But so I began uh, practicing zazen. The instruction were two minutes in the morning upon waking oh. and two minutes mm -hmm. at night oh. before retiring. And then over time, gradually growing that time, two minutes to five minutes, five minutes to seven minutes, oh. seven minutes to 10 minutes and so forth and so forth. But I went back for Sunday service. And I was really glad I did. Mm. The right, sense, yeah. so. so I heard the evening got there. Let me respectfully remind you, life and death are of supreme importance. Time swiftly passes and opportunity is lost. 
each of us should strive to awaken. Awaken and take heed. With this night, your days are diminished by one. Do not squander your life. So that spoke directly to what was calling me to do hospice work. And it was a most amazing feeling to, to have this resonate um, in, a, in a small rented one bedroom apartment. So in Las Cruces. So I went back again for a book study on Wednesday nights. And uh, the group there was reading challenging texts. This was not a university course. Okay? So these were people in their everyday lives approaching this text and asking, what does this mean to me in my everyday life? Right? So this was Realizing Genjo Kwan by Shuaku Kumar, an amazing book. Living by Val, another amazing text by Shuaku Kumar, where he takes eight essential chants and texts and analyzes them from a very ground level perspective of how they can apply to your life. And then uh, and a, a third that I remember in particular is called How to Cook Your Life. So it was Dogen's instructions to the Tenzo, uh, but commentary by Koshino Uchiyama, mm -hmm. which was uh, an amazing approach to treating each grain of oh. rice like your eyeballs, <laughs> but concentrating and focusing on the on what you're doing at the time. So. Um, I was drawn to this as a very deep perspective, and yet it seemed so familiar. And why did it seem familiar? I think my approach, again, was as service, and the practicality of this perspective for service seemed to be so um, allowing one to connect most directly to another person. So why don't we go on to the next one? So I was becoming more serious about my practice and my life and considering chaplaincy. And um, one of Daiho's students came to, from El Paso to give a reading right before I get down. So this is, um, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. Oh. I, I jumped ahead, you didn't jump ahead. Oh. <laughs> so again, another, Another quote from Genzo Kwan, to study the Buddha way is to study the self. Right? So the practice, the study focus is here, not anywhere else. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be verified by all things. And that's a beautiful translation. But I also appreciate this translation by Reverend Kato, who has taught Buddhism here at Zenshuji, and was also one of those early Zen, Soto Zen missionaries to the United States. And he says, he translates that same verse, to learn Buddhism is to learn yourself. To learn yourself is to forget yourself. And to forget yourself is to be one with every existence, right? So here, learning implies the study and the practice, the integration of the two, right? You're studying with an intent to learn, to apply it, not only to yourself, but in engagement with others. So I'm getting increasingly hooked by this text and by my interest in chaplaincy. And um, so I hear one of Daiho's students is coming to do a poetry reading at a, v a VFW hall in Las Cruces. And um, so I go, but he introduces his poetry reading with the five remembrances of the Buddha, which I know Lori also sort of referenced in, in other texts, right? Mm -hmm. Which are, I am of the nature to grow old. There is nothing I can do to prevent from growing old. I am of the nature to become ill. There is nothing I can do to prevent becoming ill. 
I am of the nature to die, and there is nothing I can do to prevent death. All the people and things that I love will change, and there's nothing I can do to, be, to keep from being separated from them. My actions, you all see this one. my actions are my only true possessions. My actions are the ground upon which I stand. And this is the poet, uh, the late Reverend Bobby Kankenbird, who passed away July 7th, 11th of this year. And Bobby became my first teacher. He, his sangha, was in his converted one-car garage behind his house in El Paso, Texas. Mm -hmm. And every Sunday, I would drive 30, 40 miles from Las Cruces to El Paso, mm -hmm. open the gate and put out the sun so people could tell they were welcome for his Zen meditation and sweep the, the way mm -hmm. and prepare the cushions. So, but Bobby really was a poet and his many published poems. And he and his wife, Lee, owned a publishing company called Cinco Puntos Press, which specialized in publishing bilingual educational material, poetry, fiction, and even history about the border. Being bilingual, one of the reasons we moved to that area was to do work on the border. So here I'm doing hospice work on the border, connecting with Buddhists in the lineage of Matsuoka Roshi. So it's, it's um, amazing, my, my little life. Um, Bobby at the time was doing koan work. Well, let's, what else can I tell you about the Sangha? So the service that Bobby did was a wonderful preparation for me to come to Zen Shuji because not only were we doing chants and verses in English, we also did them in the traditional Sino Japanese. So um, having already memorized the Heart Sutra and things like that with, with Bobby Sangha was a, was a beautiful practice. Um, we, had, we had large bells, we had makugyo, we, you know, this sort of was a good introduction, I mm -hmm. think, to the practice, to really complete uh, Zen priest practice. But again, it was largely a community of la laity. Um, Bobby was, at the time, beginning to do koan work himself with a fellow named uh, Reverend Chodo Campbell. And Chodo is part of a team with Koshin Ellison in New York, uh, New York Zen Center for Contemplative Care. So I began to do a little bit of koan work with Bobby, but my interest in chaplaincy, in doing no harm as a chaplain, um, led me to inquire with the New York Zen Center for Contemplative Care. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess I skipped taking the precepts. <laughs> so, <laughs> so with Bobby's group, and this is not everyone in the, in the group, but this was the, sort of the, the people that at the time had received the precepts. And Veronica and I were the sort of the newest ones to enter that, enter that group. So... Um, Mixed racially, mixed somewhat age, but um, wonderful people. Lawyers, uh, social workers, uh, people with uh, martial arts study, and people that were um, technology consultants uh, in the area with um, UTEP, University of Texas, El Paso. So it was a great group of people. So thank you. So I actually then um, entered a program with the New York Zen Center for Contemplative Care called Foundations, in which uh, every month for nine months, this group of 40 plus people would gather in New York and uh, exchange views, challenge each other on their readings and their reflections on the readings, uh, as well as listen to speakers and um, that was, a, that was just one, there were artists, there were just, just amazing group of people, some very dedicated people. Um, but in addition to these classes, our group encounters, we also did a nine month internship in a nursing home. I did mine in my hospice center in Las Cruces, um, in hospitals, in mental hospitals. So there were just 
a variety of professionals that were engaged in this. And that was also very illuminating to see their interest in Buddhist practice as a support for their work, as a way to demonstrate to live more compassionately with the people that they're serving and to operate in a, or try to transform the wisdom of the institution where they might be operating. So there, on many levels, this was a, just a marvelous inquiry. Um, but again, they're committed to transforming lives and the care of lives through Zen practice, contemplative caregiving and learning. And they are related, the two teachers, uh, Chodo is the one with the beard, and uh, Koshin uh, San is next to him with the big smile. They are um, come through the, the lineage of the White Plum Asanga, which is from Taizan Maizumi Roshi, who is also a priest here at Zen Shuji, missionary to many, and founder of the Zen Son of Los Angeles. And so he meets people. So, um, going through this program then helped me, uh, having taken early retirement from my previous careers, to decide if I was going to pursue a Master's of Divinity full-time. And, um, and so that's what I did, and uh, applied then to the University of the West, which is um, here in Rosemead, California. I got a chance to, I think, the next slide. Yeah. So... Very fortunate to study, not only with other Americans, but with the, the pan-Asian Buddhism, Buddhisms that were represented, that were here to also study chaplaincy. Mm -hmm. Because chaplaincy, in many cases, is not a practice in Asian countries, but it's a curious <clears throat> way um, for them to look at Buddhism in this country and to consider themselves serving their linguistic populations and cultural populations here in hospital, in crisis, uh, in family therapy, et cetera. So these were a number of my colleagues uh, in the chaplaincy program. And the late Reverend Tom Shuichi Kurai, who was then the abbot of Suzenji Buddhist Temple in Montebello, and uh, Reverend, Reverend Karai had developed a relationship with the University of the West and was very welcoming to chaplaincy students that came to him. And he uh, accepted me as a student. So I began working with him then in conjunction with my program at the University of the West. He um, asked me to become a member of the board of directors of the organization quite early on. Um, and in part because he was ill at the time. He was suffering from leukemia and he was positioning himself for a um, bone marrow transplant, which was very successful, but nonetheless, he, he did succumb within the year. So I, um, but his family is, maybe this is a unique story and I don't know, I haven't asked Kojima Sensei, but the tradition in Japan is for the son, typically the eldest son, to inherit the temple that the father has inherited from their grand, from their parents and so on mm -hmm. down the line. So the, the family tradition of holding temples and becoming ministers, becoming priests, is the, is the standard. In the United States, it's not so much the standard, but it was the standard at Sozenji because the first abbot of Suzenji Buddha's temple was Reverend Kurai's father. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Reverend Kurai had not anticipated becoming a priest, but as he was growing and as his father was aging, they came to an understanding. And um, Reverend Kurai did go to Japan and studied and became very, um, a very wonderful teacher. He was also a uh, Taiko master. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we have many stories about his Taiko then. So, let me take the next slide. As he was ill, um, when he was not able to, to lead us in Sashin, 
it's a Buddhism shooter. Yeah. And we were very, myself and the other students were very fortunate to be so warmly welcomed here um, to participate both with the Zazakai and the other priests and um, the entire community. So um, we, the Rohatsu Sashin is a, a very special time of year to celebrate and to focus on and to actually practice as the Buddha did when the Buddha became enlightened, um, intensive Zazen for eight days, seven days, usually it's from December 1st to December 8th. But it's also meal practice, study practice, work practice, zazen practice. So it's, it's movement within the community, everyone doing the same activity at the same time. And it, it's quite a beautiful practice. You might look a little tired here, because this was, I think, three o'clock in the morning on the last day yeah. of the Ruhatsu Sashin. So uh, it was, but, but look, we're all smiling. <laughs> so it was very, very rewarding. But one of the most intriguing things to me about that first and all subsequent Rohatsu Sashin here at Zenchuji is at the last, like 20 minutes of the last sit each day, we read out loud together the entire Fukan Zazenki, mm -hmm. which is Dogen's universally recommended instructions for Zazen. And these particular passes, uh, passages are the ones that, um, that I live with. Suppose you're confident in your understanding and rich in enlightenment, like, you know, you've got this, right? Gaining the wisdom that knows at a glance, attaining the way and clarifying the mind, arousing an aspiration to reach for the heavens. Uh, but you're just playing in the entranceway. You're not, no, no, not, that's not it. That's not it. Put aside the intellectual practice of investigating words and chasing phrases. Turn the light. Take the backward step okay, that turns the light and shines it inward to that Buddha nature. Right? That's where you get to know it, right? On the cushion. Body and mind will themselves, of themselves drop away and your original face will manifest. And if you want to do this, get to work on it like me. So I think that's my message of practice today. I complimented our, our illustrious academic and, and teacher. <laughs> so, so I've tried to say basically again, we're inheriting a practice. This practice is a treasure and it requires us to Accept it with deep respect and probably challenge it a little too, right? See, how does it apply here now? But, but be mindful that we're inheriting this practice. And then the largest part, right? Strive to live the practice, which inquire, it requires careful with the motivation of not doing harm engaging self which enables you to engage other with the same respect and then with the hope always to carry the practice forward okay so that was my last one questions okay now i'm going to ask uh don't you stay up here and have a seat, and Lori will come back up here and have them take questions from the audience. Um, let me just move okay, this yeah. a little bit out of the way. We need that. Um, and let me just start with the audience here. If you're on Zoom, please put your question in the chat and Either Nikki or Miyazaki Sensei will read it or, or mm -hmm. will identify it. Um, so let's open the floor. Well, I have a curious question. So, what is uh, this is for uh, 
Um, what is one question you hear over and over about Buddhism to your students? I'm curious. I feel like in the beginning of the term, I often get a lot of sort of technical questions about transmigration and how does this work and how does that achieve cosmological questions. Um, but but I think I don't know that there's yeah sort of like one question that I hear again and again. Um, Has it changed over about, the years? You said you said you've been over twenty years. Yeah. Has anything changed years. in terms of that? Do you think people know about Buddhism more from when you started to now? I think to a certain degree, yes. I mean, we have a, a lot, a much larger uh, number of students uh, enrolling at USC who grew up in Asia. And so um, I think a lot, there are a lot more students who are just, who grew up knowing something about Buddhism, even if they didn't practice Buddhism. Um, so I have, I think I, I feel like I have a lot more students now who, um, who may have you know, studied Buddhism in, in, especially in China, but in other places as well. Um, and so uh, they're asking often, you know, much more complex questions about, uh, you know, my teacher, what do you think? And, um, uh, and they're in, but often interested in reading texts that are different from the ones that were emphasized in their tradition. So, you know, if you grow up in a particular place in Asia, the, the emphasis on Buddhist texts might be, you know, one group of texts. I mean, I often talk about how there are just so many Buddhist texts, right? You can almost talk more about a Buddhist library than a Buddhist canon <laughs> because there are thousands of texts. And so uh, if you grew up in one area, there may be one or two texts that were really emphasized by your teacher, um, whereas a Buddhist from another part of Asia uh, may be reading completely different texts, right? So often there's interest in like, oh, now we get to read lots of different texts um, from lots of different, you know, different Buddhist traditions. So I think that's fun for a lot of students too, if, if they come in with some kind of background. Um, okay. All right, thank you. I was wondering for both of you, since this is Buddhism in America mm -hmm. and the mainstream sort of religious assumptions are Christianity, and so with your students, how do they square what they're learning about the mm. principles of Buddhism with their knowledge of and their background of Christianity? They say, oh, that's like the Bible says this, or that's, I mean, do they kind of work through that comparison? <clears throat> and for Doshin, you had mentioned your mother, which was a really interesting, <laughs> the, the ticket to hell. And maybe not necessarily focusing on your mother, but you probably, you, I know you come from a Christian background. Just how do you, how did that process worked out of swearing the Buddhism with the background of Christianity. Do you, do you want to start? Sure. I guess. Um, Wait, and let me add, question. Lori, this could also be a personal question. Because I know <laughs> sure, that you come from sure. a Christian background as well. And how did you get interested in Buddhism? Yeah. Yeah. Well, mm, I grew up Catholic, which was my mother's religious tradition at the time when the mass was still in Latin. So I'm talking about that. Um, and I had come to hold my Christianity very loosely uh, for a number of reasons that uh, relate to the domestic violence in my home and the way the priest was counseling my mother about, as I was learning about First Communion and the importance of communion, my mother was sort of threatened by the priest that if she were to leave my father, she would be refused to leave. And as a seven-year-old, I found that not, that didn't square with me. It was a little unjust. And then um, just sort of the, the general, again, we're talking a few decades ago, and things have changed some, but I was affected by them then, uh, the role of women and what women can and can't do in, in certain aspects of the tradition. So I had, and evangelism can be used as a, um, a weapon, right? So I'd seen a lot of um, abuse, I would say, of uh, Christianity and in Catholicism and history and in contemporary life. So um, by the time I went to, um, seminary, the 
my need was very personal for acting on faith, of engaging the other. Um, and it was not really couched in a Christian framework. Uh, and so I chose one of the most liberal seminaries, I think, in the country um, and, um, and appreciated uh, their education part time. Yeah. Sort of, I have a sort of similar um, background in the sense that I, I grew up evangelical, so it's sort of a, the other side of Christianity. Mm -hmm. right? so, um, but uh, yeah, my, we went to church all the time, and I, I think over time, partially for some of the same reasons, like I also was very um, kind of vexed by evangelical views of womanhood and what you. Know, I was kind of taught to be a good student, but then when I enjoyed studying, oh, well, you have to be a stay-at-home mom and wife and, because this is what a good woman does and so on. And so uh, I think I was sort of starting to rebel already in high school. And um, so as much as I talked about Buddhism not being, a, not, what, not wanting to focus on it as a countercultural or alternative <laughs> tradition, that, that is what it was for me um, in many ways. Like this was, I, I found uh, Buddhism just, um, what uh, Buddhist ideas is very liberating from, from the way I had grown up, from the perspective of, of the teachings I had grown up with. Um, I think, I think the sort of hardcore evangelicals uh, at USC probably don't take my class. <laughs> so I don't encounter a lot of students sort of pushing back of like, oh, well, you know, this is uh, problematic because you know, the Bible says this or that. Um, so I, I don't see much pushback in, in that way. I think some students um, who grew up Christian or and, and some Catholic students, I mean, uh, one thing I've been really impressed with, a lot of students who grew up Catholic did take some kind of world religions course, and it wasn't just why are the other religions wrong, which is like well, what I grew up with. <laughs> but um, it's actually, you know, courses that seem to, where they seem to learn something about other religious traditions. Um, so a lot of those students have really great questions and are, are very interested in sort of thinking about uh, interfaith dialogue and things like that. Um, do, they, do they Christianize the Buddhist teachings in a way just to make it Oh, right, to make it more understandable. Yeah. I think... I mean, I haven't seen that as much lately. I think certainly with um, like Pure Land teachings, when we get to, so if you're familiar with the Tani Show by Shinran, um, I think a lot of students see Pure Land thought as having certain similarities or parallels with Christian thought, especially the emphasis on uh, kind of belief or faith that leads to uh, birth in, in a paradise. Um, so, so that's a pretty common parallel that students will draw. Um, I, I did teach a course just for fun. I'm doing a, uh, some, a research project on uh, something called the Blood Bowl Hell, which is uh, these, this Buddhist hell uh, for women that's made up of uterine blood. It's kind of awful, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but historically it was really Im important um, in much of East Asia. And uh, so as I was thinking through this project, I developed a course on um, kind of comparative views of the afterlife. And we looked mostly at Christian and Buddhist views. We, we considered some other religious traditions as well. Um, but uh, I think that was, I mean, I had, a, I had quite a few students from some kind of Christian background in, in that. And it was really interesting to sort of, I mean, most people don't associate Buddhism with hell, but of course there are a lot of hells in, the, in, Buddhist, in classical Buddhist texts. It's part of the tradition. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's kind of interesting to, to think about how the, I, the concept of hell was used differently um, in different traditions and so on. Okay, yeah. we, have, we, have, we have several questions on the chat. Um, so Sophia asked, uh, can Professor Meeks explain more what dualism means in Buddhism? Ah, sure, sure. So um, in, in talking about dualism here, I'm sort of coming back to the idea that we see um, really emphasized in Mahayana thought that um, nothing has its own kind of stable, inherent identity. Nothing can be completely separated from anything else. And of course, this builds on uh, the early Buddhist idea that there is no self. There is no kind of stable, coherent self, that the self is always changing 
in Mahayana thought, that idea is sort of developed further so that it's not only the self that's constantly changing, but really all of the concepts that uh, we engage with, everything in the world is uh, made up of, of the uh, coming together of different causes and conditions at a particular moment in time. Um, and so that if we, we tend to um, what imagine or, or believe that things are very clearly separated and clearly categorized, um, and we fail to see uh, how, how interlinked things actually are, right? How one idea depends on another idea for its meaning and so on. So dualism is more of, I guess in, in some ways it's more of a Western term brought in to explain this idea, but dualism would be to see things as separate from each other, as having their own you know, stable, coherent identities that are separate from each other. Um, it's, it's a huge topic that we usually spend a lot of time on in class because it's, it takes a long time to wrap your head around it, but I hope that's useful. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Also, uh, Mika uh, asked uh, for Doshin, how has your Zen practice, specifically of counting breath and um, Chikantaza in Zaza, enhanced your skills in serving hospice patients? and also mm -hmm. those with mental disease in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And then she continues for Lori, mm -hmm. can you take a little bit on, uh, can you talk a little bit on dedications of the Buddha and the Bodhisattva in many of the Buddhist traditions, specifically those in Japan? On, on, I'm sorry, what about the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas? The... Uh, Deification. Oh, deification. Oh, okay, sure, sure. Thank you. So I'm sure. Um, so breath work is is very important and very useful with patients and families uh, for um, for calming, for centering, for releasing. Um, I don't always have the opportunity to uh, teach or apply or train someone, you know, in hospice with these kinds of techniques. I'm really there to hold space for them. Um, I'm there to help them uh, resource their own Buddha nature. I mean, that's sort of my perspective that I bring. So, um, I listen a lot. I approach this with the not knowing mind. That's something that I'm sure Lori is familiar with. Uh, and I try to actually witness their experience in the most open way possible. So it is true that Zazen helps me, my practice, uh, to have an open mind, to bring an open mind. But it's not something that I teach or train or use with others unless that is their tradition. So, so that's in hospice. Um, the practice that I had at the VA related to um, substance abuse and addiction, mostly. Um, we taught, um, I taught classes on spirituality to try to introduce the element of spirituality as integral with uh, releasing addictive behaviors, right? So um, that's how, but I did also, I, I lobbied for and was able to organize a, um, a meta meditation exercise uh, over the course of time. And the most difficult part was to um, allow space for people to accept that they could wish well for themselves. And yet that's also a beginning healing point for uh, recovery um, for many. So um, in those instances, I, I use my practice. Mm -hmm. So the question was about the deification of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas uh, in Japan specifically? Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Um, 
That's a big question. <laughs> but I guess, I mean, in many ways, I think we can th think about you know, the act of venerating uh, the Buddha goes all the way back to early Indian practices and, um, and you know, these devotional practices that can, can earn merit for individuals. And so we see that that practice of venerating uh, the Buddha you know, go, goes way back. But with the, with the uh, development of Mahayana Buddhism, of course, we see the rise of, of all kinds of bodhisattvas who are also venerated. Um, and I guess, I mean, the way I usually talk about it is in terms of, um, and I'm, this is, many people talk about it this way, it's not all unique to me, but uh, the idea that you can both um, emulate the Buddha, you can sort of follow the Buddha's path yourself, and this might mean becoming a monastic, for example, but you can also venerate the Buddha. So there's sort of, both practices are, have been important to the tradition. Um, and of course, venerating Buddhism bodhisattvas has been a really important part of um, the kind of the success of Mahayana Buddhism and spreading across so much of Asia because in many places, um, bodhisattvas came to be identified with local deities and so on. And so it was a way of integrating local deities into uh, a Buddhist view of the world so that people didn't necessarily have to give up local deities that, that they already cared about um, in order to become Buddhist, they could see, of course, this is really important in Japan, a lot of bodhisattvas come to be, and Buddhists too, come to be associated with particular kami. Um, and so it's a way of, of integrating uh, uh, different traditions in a very seamlessly often, uh, in, a very, in a very smooth way. Is there, well, we have time for one last question. We started a little bit late. Was there a question in the audience? Nikki, are there any more questions? Um, Not on chat, no. no, no, no. Do you Maybe have a know. question for each other? <laughs> <laughs> no? Oh, probably many. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, why don't we you stop there? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for Yanzaki you know, Sensei and okay. for everyone who came today online or in the audience here. Um, this was a wonderful session. Um, and I want to sort of think about the October session that we have, mm -hmm. our second to the last one. We're going to talk about the founding of Zen Shuji in 1922, and there was a book written by, or at least uh, through his, his talks, uh, the founder, Isabe Roshi, uh, and we're translating that book for the 100th anniversary. And so we'll talk about what we're finding in the translation, mm -hmm. and we'll also talk to scholars in Japan. This is gonna be entirely on Zoom, who study Zen in America, and who study Isabe Roshi in particular. Wow. So. So we'll see you next time in okay. October. Thank you so <laughs> Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.